Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost you a cent. Click the like button. takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads that I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I've taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's second half, shall we? Also, this second half gets us to the midway point. Saturday Nightmares, live from New York. I hope to see you all there, 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Guys, we really do have a lot of fun. If you haven't been to it yet, it really is a unique live stream. Encounters get shared, but we have a lot of fun. Let's get into it. Jeff, on May 17th of this year, last Friday, I went up to the area north of Flagstaff, where I had been many times since that last time I had an encounter. The very area where I saw that man, or angel, or Nordic, and the dogman fight. I've been to this area at least a dozen times in the last 18 months, each time by myself. I've been practicing carrying heavy weights, different packs, different guns, different equipment, different gear. I've been increasing my weight each time until now. I'm regularly carrying a 60-pound pack. This is not including my rifle, three handguns, and corresponding ammo. I've also been increasing my distance each time to where, on this last trip, I was doing 12-mile hike. Six miles out, six miles back, carrying approximately 60 pounds of equipment and gear, I've been doing this for two reasons, to lose weight and to get into better shape and to prepare for what may be coming in the near future. So Jeff, let me state here and now because of what happened, I will never go back into any forest ever again, armed or unarmed. I have never been so scared in my life, both with what happened during the encounter and what happened after. I'm forgetting to walk or hike in the forest in any capacity from now on. I will limit my hiking to town or public trails and I will begin playing golf again to take place of my forest excursions. Jeff, you know what I've been through better than anyone and I can tell you I will never go into the woods or forest again. So last Friday I decided to go up to my spot that I have been going to for almost two years. The spot is approximately seven to eight miles north of Flagstaff and several miles east of 89. It is a forested area, but not thick or dense forest like back east. I left my home at around eight in the morning and drove an hour or so to get to my spot. As I already stated, I was carrying about 60 pounds of gear, binoculars, water, food, two bricks for weight, three holsters, a thigh rig with a 6-inch 686 plus 357 in it, a shoulder holster carrying a 4-inch 686 plus 357 mag, an ankle holster carrying a Colt King Cobra 2-inch, also a 357 magnum, I was also carrying an old 1903A3 bolt-action rifle from World War II in 30 6 Although it is in pristine condition, it proved itself 
exceedingly. I was also carrying 26 rounds of 30 6 ammo for the rifle and nearly 100 rounds of 357 ammo for the revolvers. I had a 10-inch Bowie knife, a canteen, a flashlight, and other small assorted gear. I'm not telling you all of this to impress you or anyone else for that matter, but to impress upon you how well equipped I was and how weighed down I was. But this was entirely on purpose for the reasons I had already given. I was not intending to see anything or encounter anything. As I had been to this area since my last encounter no less than a dozen times and not seeing anything larger than a coyote. It was a warm day in the low 80s with no wind and blue skies. I was wearing brown slacks, tan polo, and a dark green windbreaker, tan color, under armor, tactical boots. I wasn't wearing anything camo, but my colors blended in fairly well with the terrain. The windbreaker was to cover my shoulder holster. With that covered, I looked pretty much like a regular hunter. Although to anyone with a keen eye, I had already too much gear on. Again, it was about weight and what I would be able to carry if heading into combat or at least weight-wise. I parked my car down the road a bit and decided to enter the forest, about a half a mile from where my car was. In other words, I parked along 89 and walked north, another half mile north, before turning east into the forest. This will be important later. I set my pedometer so that I would know when I got to six miles due east so that I could turn around and walk back the same way I had come. I had a compass, but no GPS. I know how to read a compass. But I still get nervous the further I get out from the highway. I was trying to remain exactly due east from the spot I entered the forest and return exactly due west. This will make a little more difficult for me to get lost, which I am terrified of doing. As you know, I am not a hunter or a woodsman, so I am extremely proud of myself for going so far into the deep forest alone on many different occasions. That will no longer be the case, okay? I needed to give you this context of this. My last encounter as I entered the forest, I was trying to get accustomed to the weight and the chafing that you inevitably have to deal with when carrying so much weight. But after about a half a mile or so, I got into the rhythm and everything kind of fell into place. Other than my shoulders hurting from the weight of the pack, I was feeling pretty good. When I got to the three-mile point, I stopped and drank some water, had two power bars as I hadn't eaten anything yet that day and it was approaching 10.30 a.m. Took my pack off, sat down for about a half an hour. Jeff, the beauty of this place and the stillness is truly intoxicating. I found myself wanting to take a nap there and I easily could have. At about 11 a.m., or shortly before, I put my pack back on, retightened my boots, slung my O3 over my shoulder, and began walking again. I was averaging about three miles per hour, and when you consider the terrain and weight I was carrying, that's pretty damn good. Having said that, my time slowed considerably over the next couple of miles. So much so that by the time I got to the five-mile point, a mile from the turnaround point, it was almost 1 p.m. My shoulders were hurting, so I decided to stop at that point because it was up on a bit of a hill overlooking a very shallow valley. So shallow, in fact, that it wasn't more than 20 feet below the little hill I was on, and the descent was very gradual. I was still ahead of schedule, schedule meaning making my way back to the car before dark, 7.30. So I decided to pull out my binoculars and look across this little valley, which was no more than a thousand yards wide. On the other side, where there are hills with what look like boulders and fallen trees and what appeared to be cave openings, I don't know that for sure because I never made it across the valley to find out. 
As I was looking across the valley, I noticed three large dogs on all fours, but because of their size, I immediately knew what I was looking at. After all, there are no wolves in Arizona, as far as I know anyway. They were all running around a tree, and what looked like to me, playfully looking for something. Now, for perspective, I was about a half a mile or two-thirds of a mile away from them at this point. I know they hadn't seen, heard, or smelled me at this point, especially since the slight breeze was coming towards me. I stopped and watched them for a good couple of minutes and noticed they were each beginning to stand up and sniff the air, then return to playing around the tree. I had a decision to make. I could easily turn around and cut two miles off of my hike, returning the same way I came, with very little risk. They would even know I was there. This was appealing because my shoulders and feet were starting to hurt, or I could see if I could sneak closer and get some good pictures. I have been warned at least twice and most probably three times about doing such things, but I felt looking at the terrain that I could get within a 100 yards or so without being noticed and get some great photos of these hybrid creatures and settle the argument once and for all. So, regrettably, I did. I put all my gear away except for my binoculars, which I had left on my neck, and I proceeded down the decline after checking one more time to see that the three animals were still there. And they were. I knew they would be out of sight as I descended, so I wanted to make sure I saw where they were in relation to my position. This would make it easier to approach them from the right area and at what point I needed to start looking for them again. I moved through the valley as quietly as I could, stopping every few trees to listen and see if I noticed any movement. The closer I got, the worse this decision to approach felt. I could just sense that I was either being watched or at least they had smelled me. So bad was this feeling that as I got about halfway through the valley, I stopped and brought up the O3 off my rifle. I didn't need to work the bolt chamber. A round had already been done that when I started down into the valley, and I had all full six rounds of the .30-06 ready to go. Into firing position, I thought about taking my pack off to be more mobile and a little more quiet, but the thought of being chased out of there and having to leave all the equipment just didn't sit right with me, so I pressed on. I know someone is going to say, who cares about the equipment? And to that I would say, I don't buy junk, and all my stuff is name brand and expensive, so leaving it or coming back for it is not an option. When I got about 200 yards from the far side of the valley, I could clearly see the upslope of the valley, and just beyond that, the hill that I had seen these creatures on, I noticed two things. One, the animals were no longer where I had seen them, and two, the forest had gone completely silent. I have enough experience with these creatures to know that I was in trouble. I began to think myself, you idiot. There were three of them, and now you are less than 200 yards from where they were, and you don't know where any of them are. I stopped, took a series of deep breaths, thought about my situation and what I should do. For some reason, I thought when I had left the other side of the valley that these creatures would be in the same position or at least close to it. When I realized the danger I was in, I immediately put away the childish, ridiculous idea about photographing these things and started backing away from the upslope of the far side of the valley. I suddenly stopped after a few strides, put my rifle down, and brought up my binoculars to my eyes with the hope that I could look in all directions and see nothing looking back. A moment of hope ran through my mind that maybe they had run off in some other direction and I could make better time back through the valley, which would require me to make some noise. However, if they had indeed left the area completely, I could basically start jogging back through the forest, regardless of the noise. 
After looking around in every direction, I saw no evidence of these creatures. I took a deep breath, trying to relax, picked up my rifle, and began walking briskly back the way I had come. I was now, it was now 2 p.m. or close to it. I got back to the halfway point of the valley when I noticed off to my left a slight movement. I turned to look, rifle at the ready, and to my horror, there was one of the three, or at least I assumed so at that point. Creatures looking for me from beyond the tree, but down on all fours. I need to convey the fear I was feeling at this moment, Jeff. I realize that more than likely, I was out in this valley alone with possibly three dogmen, and I was armed with a bolt-action rifle. The dogman was at least a hundred yards from me. So I continued walking, continually looking behind me to see if it was coming after me. Maybe 50 yards or so, I looked back and it was gone. I picked up my pace big time. I went another couple of hundred yards or so and I could see the upslope of the other side of the valley, the one I had come down an hour or so earlier. Something told me to stop and look around for perspective. I'm about 100, 150 yards from the upslope. I silently looked around behind me. To my right, I could see one of the three behind me at about 50 yards and approaching, but not directly at me. It hadn't occurred to me when I first saw it that it hadn't seen me. I assumed it was because I was partially obstructed from its view by the tree. I took two quick steps and got fully behind the tree, although with the backpack on, I am still only three quarters covered. I leaned out from behind the tree to see what it was doing, and it had gotten within 20 yards of me, but was looking straight ahead in the direction I had been heading. It was to my right and ahead of me by a couple of yards. He was magnificent. He was a dark brown color with streaks of black, probably seven, seven and a half feet tall, upright, with a short tail. He was not fully mature. In fact, I would later realize all three of them were young males. He did not look like a German shepherd or a Belgian Malinois in the face. He looked more like a wolf with bigger head and bigger teeth. I looked all around me to see if the other two were present. If they were, I couldn't see them. I was no more. It was no more than two, 20 yards from me. And when he stood up and smelled the air, he presented a perfect target. His head was huge, and when he lifted it up to smell the air, he made it even bigger. It would have been hard to miss him at 20 yards, so I took the shot. His head rocked to the right because the shot came from the left and he went down. When I walked over to him, I noticed he wasn't quite dead. He was making some weird gurgling noises and still moving his arms. Not wanting him to suffer needlessly, I worked the bolt of the O3, took two steps behind him, out of reach of his flailing arms, and fired the kill shot into the head six to seven feet away. He stopped moving immediately. I thought briefly about pulling out my phone and grabbing some pictures, but every fiber in my being said don't. My instincts were right. As I turned from the way I was coming, I saw his two friends, less than 50 yards away, and closing in slow but steadily. Their heads were low and their yellow eyes were incredibly and undeniably focused on me. As I approached, I was unsure about what to do next. <clears throat> it occurred to me, if they both came at me full on, I would not be able to stop them both in time because of having to work the bolt between shots. So I decided not to fire at all and let them come. I swear to God, Jeff, I think that confused them because the longer I waited to fire, the slower they approached. I got to the point where they were both within 10 yards of me, and I kept swinging my rifle back and forth between them. It was like a standoff because when I would swing the rifle towards one of them, it would stop and the other would approach, and then would swing the rifle towards that one and the other would approach. This went on 
as I was backing away from them for over a minute. I finally backed into a tree, and they seemed to stop seven to eight yards from me. And it appeared to me that they were considering what to do next. At this moment, right at this moment, I heard a helicopter approaching from the west, flying extremely low. And when I say low, I do mean low. When it finally came into view, it was less than 500 feet from the ground. It seemed to scare the two young dogmen, and they looked up and started to back away. I used this time to quickly sing the O3 across my body, diagonally, and pulling out the 686 from my thigh rig as I moved toward the upslope. I never turned my back on those two creatures and kept the 357 trained on both of them as I moved away. The helicopter did not appear to see any of us, or at least it did not act like it did. And it came back for a second pass as I approached the upslope and flew even lower over my position, not more than 300 feet off the deck. After the second pass, it seemed to fly off in the direction I was heading. I had gotten to the very spot I had been standing at when I first saw these creatures 90 minutes earlier. Once the helicopter had passed a second time, the two dogmen seemed to re-engage with me and began fouling me up the upslope. I had managed to put 80 to 100 yards between us, though, and I pulled out the other 357 and started walking as fast as I could back towards 89. The problem I had was that I was still about five miles from the highway, and not one but two dogmen were less than 100 yards behind me. There was no point of running. First, I can't run anywhere near five miles. Second, I couldn't really run even if I wanted to because the weight I was carrying. And third, these creatures weren't going to let me just run away. I was absolutely terrified because I knew I was going to have to use my wits, my guns, and my balls to negotiate my way back to the highway. I decided I would fire at them every time they got close. And this is what I did as I walked as fast as I could. I would occasionally stop, turn, and face them. Each time they would get a little closer and I would fire at them. This would push them back a few feet or so behind a tree and then as I continued walking, they would begin following again. I was truly being stalked. To make no mistake, their intent was to kill me. This went on for nearly 90 minutes until I was within a half a mile or so of the highway. I had fired well over 50 rounds of 357 at them, and I do not believe I hit either of them even once. When I got about a half a mile from the highway, I stopped behind an abnormally large tree and put the revolvers away. I looked behind me, and they were both within 60 yards of me and closing in quickly. I had decided that the 30 6 would have a lot more stopping power, even if it meant I didn't have as many rounds available. What I had decided was to let them get close enough to try and kill one or both of them instead of just scaring them away with the revolvers. I must say, Jeff, the fear and terror had turned into anger and rage. I stepped out and aimed at the larger of the two, who by now was 30 yards away. And when he saw me standing there, sorry, with my rifle, he slid to a stop and tumbled head over heels. I fired and assumed I missed because I saw no blood or reaction from him. The other one had moved to my left and it appeared to me he was trying to get between me and the highway. When I saw him move behind a tree, I turned and started jogging toward the highway as quick as I could. Once again, a helicopter, white with markings I could not read, flew low over the position coming from the direction of the highway. I saw the one I had fired at and ran in the direction away from me. The other one was nowhere to be seen, or so I thought. I walked an eighth of a mile or so toward the highway, and when I was about three-tenths of the mile or so to the road, I saw a flash of black or brown coming at me from my very direction. 
I had seen him run when he was trying to get behind me. I was only, it was only 15 yards or so from me when I turned to face it. He was on all fours and I hit him in his left shoulder causing him to tumble to his left away from me. He got up and limped away in the same direction his buddy had gone. I lifted up the rifle to finish him, but by the time I focused on him to get ready to fire, he was far enough away that he was not a threat anymore. The last sight I had of them was him running into the forest, limping and, atten and attempting to catch up to his buddy. I stopped, fell to my knees, and then my ass, and let the rifle fall onto my lap. It was now approaching 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and I was exhausted, hungry, thirsty, adrenaline crashing, shaking like a scared old woman. I sat there for what must have been five minutes, occasionally glancing at where I had last seen this dog man enter the deeper forest. Fortunately, they were gone. When I was getting up and brushing off my, my ass, I noticed this guy approaching me from the highway. He was an average-looking guy, Caucasian, 6'6", six, six, with military-style haircut, about my age or slightly older. I slung the rifle over my shoulder and started walking toward him. The first thing he did, to my surprise, is say hi. Was all that gunfire from you? I said, you know it was, as I continued walking by him. I knew he was some sort of government man. What else could he be? He said, can I talk with you for a minute after all oh, we are cleaning up your mess? I stopped dead in my tracks and turned to face him. I said, my mess? He said, Brad, we know exactly who you are and exactly what you've done. I said, then you know that I came out here to hike and I haven't purposely disobeyed any warnings, especially the last. He said, I know that's what I want to talk to you about. Follow me to my truck. We finished walking the last quarter of a mile to the highway, and he said, where's your car? I said, it's down the road a bit. I told my partner that Toyota, I told my partner that Toyota way down in the road was yours. I said, you probably ran my plate and knew for sure that it was my car. He said, actually, I didn't. As we approached his truck, which was parked on the other side of the highway, I noticed another guy sitting in the opened tailgate of this Ford pickup. As we crossed the road to get to his truck, I asked what was his name. He replied, Steve, and my partner is Darren. I nodded to Darren and got a nod back. I'm not even going to ask what agency you are from. And he said, good, because we couldn't tell you if we wanted to. I asked, what do you want from me? He said, you just need to listen closely to what I am about to tell you. I nodded and said, I'm listening. He said, you are the only one, only person we have come across who has had as many encounters as you've had with these creatures and still to be in one piece? I said, I'm lucky. He said, it's more than that. Has it ever occurred to you that your odds of one person having so many encounters is a statistical impossibility? I said, it actually has occurred to me. He said, it's not random. Have you ever heard of how bloodhounds and other tracking dogs will be attracted to certain people and not others? I responded, yeah, I have. I started to say something else when he interrupted with me. It's almost like they are attracted to certain people more than others, but in a good way as it relates to tracking dogs. I said, you're not about to tell me these creatures are tracking me or following me home, are you? He said, don't be ridiculous. That's all bullshit about fouling people. I said, okay, then what are you saying? We've discovered that approximately three to 5% of the population have a particular scent that attracts them 10 times more than the other part of the population. I said, so obviously I am one of that part of that population. Is that what you're telling me? Not exactly. You are have a probability of being in that 
I said, well, that explains a lot. Everybody in the paranormal community thinks I am a liar or at least an exaggerator. I followed with, I have done something to increase this scent thing, or is it just something I was born with? He said, no, it is natural from birth. You have had a lot of strange things happen in your life when you're outdoors in the woods, and I laughed. You mean besides five encounters with dogmen in three different states? He laughed, and so did his partner. Now that you mention it, I have had a lot of weird things happen to me in my life, both indoors and outdoors. It's been like that my whole life. He said, well, now you know why. As far as I know, there are only a handful of you in the entire country who have actually killed more than one of them and lived to talk about it. He went on, you've now killed three, I interrupted before he could finish. I've only killed two, he said. Trust me, you've killed three. I knew he must be referring to the dog man that I wounded in Oklahoma. One of them that we thought had just been wounded must have died, but he didn't elaborate. He started to get into his truck and his partner walked around the passenger side of the truck to get in. And I said, is that it? You came all this way out to tell me? No, there's one other thing. If I were you, I would stop going into the forest or any state or national parks altogether. It seems like the scent gets stronger. As you get older, as you are less able to defend yourself, you're going to be 55 your next birthday, right? I nodded. He states, your, lucky will your luck will eventually run out, and it will happen when you least expect it. He went further. You don't want to, you don't, you do what you want, but I'm telling you, I would do what I would do, especially with the run of luck you've had. Why push it? I said, you're not going to make me sign an NDA or warn me not to tell anybody. They both laughed. Brad, most people don't believe you anyway. And a small group who do aren't a concern. You can tell who you want. You can even go on your buddy's show in New York if you want. I said, thanks for telling me this. I appreciate it. You needed to know before you get yourself ki killed. Now hop in the back of the truck and we'll drop you off to your car. I responded, no thanks. I'll walk. I need to decompress. He said, after that, anybody would. Take care and pulled off. I waved as he pulled away. I walked a half mile or so to the car, put my gear in the truck, got in the car, in the trunk, got into the car and was home an hour or so later. I have been thinking about it ever since, Jeff. They know who you are. They know who I am. It's freaky. But all of it's starting to make sense now. Like I said, I will never go into the woods or state or national parks again, period. All right, so that is the experience that Brad shared with me. I shared it with you guys. Uh, some subscribers that live in that area heard it. and. This is, per Brad, right from Brad's mouth, what happened afterward. All right, everyone. Tonight I have a really good friend of mine and of the channel. Uh, Brad is with us. Brad, how are you tonight? Hello, Jeff. Glad to be back. Let me say hello to your wonderful audience. Hope everybody's doing well. Awesome. Um. You and I last spoke, I think, a couple, I don't know, a month ago, two months ago, and you had made note that you were not going out in the woods anymore. You were done officially after your last experience. Um, you really felt kind of, kind of lucky at that one, you know, and it kind of, kind of gave you a little wake up call. Um, this isn't your experience. I know you're going to you're going to explain all of it, but I want to, you know, make sure that people really understand that, you know, this is not 
your experience. You're not a man that goes back on his word. You know, you, you when you say something, you mean it. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you and uh, let you explain and share. Okay, well, as Jeff said, this, this encounter um, was not my encounter. Uh, it had nothing to do with me, even though I do play a part in this. And as we get to that part of the story, you'll, uh, your audience uh, and you will see how I do have a small part in this, but not because I was out in the woods or had any type of physical or um, literal encounter myself. In fact, as usual, it was a strange set of circumstances how this story um, was related to me. Um, I don't go anywhere, as I said on my last show with you, which was my last encounter, and I hope it will be my last encounter. I don't go anywhere. There's not pavement anymore. Um, <laughs> I don't even go up, um, you know, even if it's a well-traveled um uh, trail if it's dirt i won't go up it unless it's paved and that type of thing and you know some people may say that i have become scared and and I, you know, i'm sure there's some truth to that but you know everything i've ever said is true and if you have gone through what i've gone through it would make you reticent about going into the woods at all especially after you have some government agent tell you that you really need to quit while you're ahead yeah. And so I took that to heart, and that's the reason why I will never, except for the one exception that one of these days we'll have to tell people about, but except for the one exception that you and I know about, I will never go um, into the woods um, again. So what I'm going to do is, for your audience, I'm going to read, um, this happened, this uh, story was related to me two Fridays ago. And because it took me so long to sit here and write this out because I was trying to remember everything, I, I wrote most of it a while ago when it was fresh, and then I finished it today before I sent it to Jeff. Um, so I'm just going to, rather than me trying to remember the sequence of events, I, I'm just going to read. I hope that's okay with your audience. I'm just going to read the email that I sent to Jeff. Yeah. Um because it's fresher and the facts, I, I know people think I, I usually give good details and I do, I try to, you know, remember the best I can, but this was given to me by the people who uh, had this encounter. So again, I want to reiterate, this is not my encounter. I was not there. I wasn't involved in this. This was told to me by three gentlemen um, in a diner. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Yeah. And this is, I'm going to read the email that I sent to Jeff, and Jeff has a copy of this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, Jeff, this is your old buddy, Brad. I hope things are well. Everything copacetic over here. Okay, buddy. So first, let me state emphatically, this encounter had nothing to do with me in a physical or literal sense. I only know about it because of a weird set of circumstances. I know that's nothing new as it relates to me. That took place about two weeks ago. I believe this happened on Friday, June 28th. I was out running some errands in the late afternoon, and after finishing them, I decided to stop at a local diner for an early dinner. Um, this particular diner closes at 4 o'clock. It's like a lot of old people go there. That's why it closes so early. So I got there uh, about 3.30, had the what I normally do when I go there, the Philly cheesesteak and fries. And I was sitting in a booth, and to my direct left were three good old boys who appeared to be um, hunters. Uh, they were, you know, big into guns, hunting, camouflage, and outdoors uh, in general. You could tell by looking at them. Uh, turns out this group uh, was normally a foursome, as the older guy who... Um, or what I would call the leader. Anyway, uh, he had a son. I miss I misread there. Um, let me get back to where I was at. Oh, yeah, two of them were older guys, probably a little older than me. The third guy was a younger man in his early 30s who turned out to be the son of what I would later call the leader of these guys. They were all salty white guys who were big into guns, hunting, camouflage, and the outdoors in general. Uh, turns out the group is normally a foursome as the other old guy who was not the leader also had a son in his mid thirties 
uh, who wasn't with them at the diner. Apparently, he was still at work and couldn't attend the meal uh, that these three were having. These guys had arrived quite a bit before I did because when I ordered my food, they were already finishing their meals. And I was, as I was eating, I could hear everything they were saying, almost to the point of it irritating me. Um, about halfway through my meal, I noticed their tone changed, and they started speaking where I could just barely hear them. The young guy kept uh, looking around to see if anybody was listening. When he did, I, I looked like I was looking at my phone. Um, just about the same time I finished my dinner, I heard the young guy say to the older guys, he was east of the 89 above Flagstaff. Uh, the old man said he must have been pretty close to where we were. At this point, I hadn't put it together yet, but I was somewhat interested in what they were saying just because of the location they were talking about. Then the older guy that I called the leader said, Brad must have walked through the sunken valley that we walked through. <laughs> Naturally, as soon as I heard that, I turned and looked at all three of these guys. My first thought was, holy shit, are they talking about me? The older guy continued, it's hard to believe he was out there in that area with a bolt-action rifle after what we encountered. I knew when he said that they were talking about me. The young guy continued, this guy is either completely fearless or an idiot, or maybe both. And they all laughed. <laughs> the quiet older man said he has encountered these animals a few times before, but even so, he must have been scared shitless. And as you know, Jeff, I was absolutely scared shitless. They all said some really nice things about me and how brave I was, not even being a hunter or an outdoorsman. They said some other really complimentary things, but for the sake of modesty, I'll move on in the story. Um, at this point, they were getting ready to leave and wanting the waitress to bring their check. So um, she had brought mine. The diner was closing and all the servers and the bus people were cleaning tables and refilling all the condiments on the tables. And I was getting out of as I was getting out of the booth uh, with my check, I stopped by their table and I leaned over and I very quietly said, "Excuse me, guys, I'm sorry to interrupt, but by chance, are you guys talking about the Brad who killed the dog man north and east of Flagstaff in '89?" They all seemed surprised and a little suspicious. The young guy completely turned to face me and said, "What is that to you?" Can you imagine my thoughts at that moment, Jeff? I wanted to say, I'm Brad, knucklehead, but I didn't. And I could understand their apprehension. I said, you guys must be listeners of Jeff Nadalny's uh, Dogman Research Channel. I forgot the paranormal part. I knew um, it, had been, it had to be your channel because I have never given it to anyone else uh, since leaving the other guy two years ago. They all looked at each other and said, you listen to him? I said, not only do I listen, he and I have become friends. And that did seem to take a bit of the edge off, but the young guy still didn't seem real interested in talking with me. The older guy asked, are you a hunter? I said, no, just an old surfer from SoCal. I had to give him one hint, right, Jeff, to be fair? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, old man, the old man continued, and I did that on purpose. I, that was their hint if they were paying attention. The old man, he continued um, – what can we do for you? And then he paused, like asking my name without asking. And I said, I'm Brady. And they all gave me their names and we shook hands. The young guy who was already suspicious of me said, Brady, that's your name? I nodded and moved on. They got their check and we started to get up uh, to move to the register. I just came right out and said, uh, can I speak with you guys outside? They looked at each other kind of tentatively and said, okay, collectively. As fate would have it, their car was parked right next to mine. So when we got outside, I leaned up against my car and I began my questioning. Then all on cue, they all on cue folded their arms, you know, in the universal signal for being defensive and waited for me to start. I said, um, uh, I said, I overheard you guys say that you were up in the same area Brad was east of 89. The old man who did most of the talking from this point forward said, we walked through the very area he must have walked through because there are no other sunken valleys anywhere in that area. And we were about five or six miles, give or take, from the highway. I said, you said you, you walked through it. Where were you headed? He said, we actually were trying to find the area Brad was in once we, and once we found it, we moved um, north following a small trail. 
a small animal trail. I said, I forgot to ask, what made you go where Brad went and what were you intending to do? The young guy spoke up and said, we had heard there was a den of these um, creatures up in the area, in that area, and we figured where Brad encountered them was as good a place as any to start looking. I said, a den? What were you going to do if you found the den? The older the other old quiet guy, the uh, older guy who was the quiet one, but he said fir- firmly, quietly but firmly, he said, kill dogmen. I said, you guys were planning on hunting and killing dogmen? The leader said, boy, we didn't, he said to me, boy, we didn't plan on killing them. We did kill them. They all chuckled knowingly. I haven't been called a boy in 30 years, but I let it go. I said, how do you hunt dogmen in a den of them, no less? The young guy smiled at me and said, fully automatic rifles with 40-round magazines, and then started laughing. I couldn't help myself. I said, holy shit, and I started laughing too. The old man who was the leader jumped in and said, you ain't going to tell anybody you're not supposed to, are you, boy? I said, no, not anybody I'm not supposed to. I said, I'm a gun guy, and I have been my whole life, so forgive me for asking, but how did you guys get a hold of fully automatic weapons? The quiet old man said, I'm a gunsmith. I said, ah, nothing else needs to be said. They proceeded to tell me how the four of them had decided to kill as many of these animals as they could. And just so I'm clear, I didn't motivate these guys to do this hunt. They had been planning this for a long time. What I added was a place to start the search. That's where I come in, not because I was involved or because I motivated to do them or I know these. I don't even know these guys. Uh, They used where I had gone on my last encounter to start the search, their search, figuring there must have been a den or at least a population of these animals uh, somewhere within hiking distance. Turns out they were absolutely right. The old man continued, about a week or maybe two after we listened to Brad on the show, we decided to go... Um, up there and see if we could find where he'd gone and then branch out from there. We are, we are from that general area, pretty much knew where to start looking and retrace his steps. I said, what are you guys doing here? Meaning where we are. This is in Northern Arizona, but a little South of where they live. And he said, we needed to stop by the local gun shop to pick up the scope for his rifle. And he pointed to the young guy. He said, we went up there heavily armed. All of us had fully automatic ARs and at least two handguns each, all 10 mil and 45 ACP. The young guy who's not here also had a 338 Win Mag bolt action rifle on his back. And this guy, pointing to the other old guy, was carrying a Mossberg 590 uh, 12 gauge on his back. We were all carrying at least five to six 40 round magazines. I kind of chuckled and I said, if you're going to go after these animals, you did it right. I continued, so tell me what happened. He said, well, when we got there and arrived, we thought Brett, where we thought Brad had been, we didn't see anything or even have the feeling any of them were close. We got to the hill we thought he had initially seen the dog man on, and we turned left or north. We followed a game trail around the base of these small hills for at least two miles. When we got to a plateau with a clearing on top, we looked across at the ridge at this ridge that was probably a quarter mile directly across from our position. We saw a large, dark gray, almost black wolf sitting on its haunches looking directly at us. The other old guy spoke up and said, I looked through my binoculars at him just to confirm what it was we were seeing. I was certain, as were the rest, that this was a dog man. The leader interrupted as soon as we looked at him through the binoculars He bolted down the other side of the ridge, and we began jogging down our hill and then up the other side where he had been. When we got to the very spot he had been, we looked down just in time to see him turn left into a box canyon that had hills on three sides and only one way in and one way out without going up steep hills. We followed him uh, into the canyon with guns up and adrenaline pumping, only to lose him completely. He was gone. We scanned around the entire small canyon and finally saw, and finally the youngster, I'm using, just so your audience knows, I'm not using their names because I do not want to get these guys in trouble. Right. And so when I'm referring to youngster, it's <clears throat> there's two young guys and two older guys, right? 
we scanned around the small uh, canyon, and finally the youngster saw a small opening, uh, no bigger than a large manhole cover, high up on the hill on the left side. It had some shrubs around it with some fallen pieces of wood in front of the hole. It clearly appeared to be put in front to make the opening opening less obvious it was about 30 to 40 feet from the top of the hill the other youngster had the idea to go up the hill with a 45 in one hand and an m80 in the other his intention was to toss it into the den to get them to come running out meanwhile the other three of us chambered our weapons and stood shoulder to shoulder in the middle of the base of the canyon pointing up at the den hole as he climbed up the hill to the far side of the opening we could see eye shine from the depths of the hole, but only just a little because of the angle we were standing at. When he got about 20 feet from the hole and to the left, he put the 45 down and took out an M80 and a lighter and lit it. He then stood awkwardly because of the incline and threw it into the hole. Time slowed down, and I watched him pick up the 45 and take two to three steps, and then we heard boom with a strange echo, which I think was because it was inside the hill. Within two seconds, as the kid was stumbling down the hill to the base, six to seven dogmen came running out of the hole, barking and growling. Um, we opened up on them, and it was a massacre. We pumped approximately 200 rounds into six or seven dogmen. I said, now this is me talking to him, I said, how do you know it was 200 rounds? He said, because two of the three of us actually put a second magazine in and emptied them. 80 plus 80 plus 40 equals 200 rounds. This does not include the 16 rounds of 45 ACP the youngster had fired when he got down the hill. We killed five of them, and at least two were wounded. Um, I lost my track there. Uh, okay, we killed five of them, and at least two were wounded, but made it back into the den. They had an arm that was attached, but only by some thin ligaments. There was blood everywhere. We basically cut them in half. When we were done firing, we quickly reloaded, expecting a second group to come out, but it never did. The other young guy walked up the other hill on the far side directly behind us to get a look into the hole. He, he could see eye shine from at least another six or seven animals. It appeared that they weren't interested in any further interaction. We thought about going on a full attack and actually going up and into the hold and finishing the job. <laughs> I started laughing when he said that. I'm like, these guys, man. Yeah. Um, uh, and finishing the job, the other guy said, we need, we need to not push our luck. And we started backing out of the canyon, covering each other all the way back to the car. We were anticipating a rear attack the entire time we were moving back to the car. <clears throat> it never came. I said, that is a hell of a story, and thank you for taking it to those animals, and thank you for telling me this. I know you didn't have to. He said, it was nice to tell someone who believes in these sadistic animals. We got to get going, he said. Uh, they all said goodbye and climbed into their truck. I said, take care, guys. Make sure you keep listening to the show. I said that because I knew I was going to give this story to you, and so I wanted to because they're going to know who they were talking to. If, they listen, if they're listening to this show right now, they're, they're going to know. know who I am. Yeah. They're going to know that they we're talking to Brad. <clears throat> anyway, I said, take care, guys, and make sure you keep listening to the show. The young guy was sitting in the front as they pulled out. Okay. And when he and as he faced me, he rolled down his window because he was in the passenger side, the passenger seat. He rolled down his window and said, take care, Brady. And he smiled with like a toothy grin and they took off. I did get the distinct feeling that he was suspicious about who I was. I got in my car and pulled out when I caught them at the parking lot driveway as we're getting ready to turn on at the main road. I was right behind them. I saw on the back of their pickup a sticker said you have a sticker on the back of their pickup that said you have to believe with a picture of Bigfoot. One hell of a story. I was happy to have played a small part in what I call the Highway 89 massacre. My words. Peace out. Yeah. When um when now the reason why he he did explain why he narrated it kind of when he shared this with me, it was, I think, a couple of days after it was, I, I think, still in June. Um, and, yeah, I think yeah. it was either uh, or just, it was still real fresh in my mind yeah. at that time. Yeah. Um, and I had asked a lot of questions because. 
there was a lot of questions that had popped up. I'm just going to bring a couple of things up um, that I had asked because, you know, where where they were was where Brad was the last time he had just went hiking with his bolt action and he had seen the two dog men um, on this kind of ridge and he had kind of seen them playing what what appeared to be playing and I was like wait was that where the den was no they were what a couple of miles from there yeah yeah so as it as it happens so, so where I was in this little sunken valley right which I talked about in my encounter they um they walked through that very same valley, and when they got to the end of that valley on the far side of it, they could see the hill that I was talking about where the tree was and the rocks, and they looked up on that hill, and they actually, you know, because they were all, I mean, they were there with fully automatic weapons, so they weren't really scared or intimidated by anything. Um, so they were, weren't being quiet or anything. They were just, you know, talking, and they came within probably 50 yards of that hill and were looking up at it. And there was no no sign of a dog man, nothing. And so they started following past this little valley. If your audience can picture it, past this little valley, there's like a space of a, like 100 yards after the tree line stops. And then there's this small, like, um, I guess you'd call it a... Um, an animal trail it's a you know game trail where small animals use you can tell that they use it because it's right up against the hills and so they followed that for two miles roughly according to him and when they got to um it kind of led and they went up onto a plateau and the reason that they decided to go up on this plateau is because it was pretty clear there were no trees in the way so they could get a good view of everything and when they got up on that plateau they looked across and there was like a rolling ridge with a tree on top and right next to the tree was a dog man sitting like a dog does mm-hmm. on its haunches uh it was just huge right and it looked at them and that's when they they realized they looked in the binoculars and they realized and then they started following it um, and I happened to catch a glimpse of it going to this little box canyon. And when I say little, I mean, this is not like that eight canyon story where, you know, the box canyon they're talking about is, you know, two miles long and four miles wide across. No, this was like a little box canyon that was probably only, you know, based on what I'm hearing and say maybe a hundred yards from one side of the hill to the other. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And they, <clears throat> and you know, they had the disadvantage, which was, and the advantage. And I remember you and I talking about this because we're, right. you know, you always want to have the high ground. Um, always. They yeah. had, they had the low ground, but they did have automatic rifles. So they did have the advantage. Um, yeah, I don't think these animals, at least based on what he told me, and this guy, these guys seem like, I mean, these guys are, it sounded to me, I, I don't know these guys, and, you know, like you pointed out, Jeff, you know, the reason that you can tell this story isn't bullshit is because they didn't come up to me. Right. Right. They, did, they didn't come up to me and start talking about this and volunteer, nor did they know who I was. I overheard this, yeah. them talking about this. So to me, their story is incredibly uh, credible, right? Yep. I know that's a weird way to say it, but there, it was a very credible story. And, you know, you really, when you get in a situation like that, you always want to be, military tactics dictate that if you can, you at least want to be eye level with your enemy or above them. But there was no way for them to get into that position because they would have had to have been standing with their feet in awkward positions if they would have been on the hill directly across from where the den hole was. There would have been no way for them to really get accurate shots and what if one of them stumbled down. So they decided that they were going to stand directly in front of the den hole down, you know, 100 feet or whatever it was. He never did say how far down it was. He said it was about 30 to 40 feet from the top of the hill is where the den hole was. And so they decided to just stand shoulder to shoulder, you know, with fully automatic weapons. And the guy that went up there, he's the guy that was the bravest, to be honest with you. He went up there with a forty-five in his hand and actually threw an M80 into this hole. Yeah. 
and you know, like you were talking about, that's like an eighth of a stick of dynamite. Yep. Yeah. Which I'm sure pissed them off, and that's why they came out. They came out the way that they did, and then they were just standing there waiting. It was a pretty good plan, actually, how they executed it. Because as they came out, I mean, they just unloaded. You're talking 200 rounds in five animal, maybe six or seven animals. So what's that? 30, 35 rounds each. Yeah. Think yeah. about that. And we're talking five, five, six. We're not talking about handgun ammunition. Right, right. And, you know, what? like you said, and I said as well right now, this wasn't fresh in your mind like the first time you told me. The first time you told me, it was like, I, I really think it was three days after because you had sent me an email saying, get a yeah. hold of me, but I didn't get the email. And you texted me, are you, you know, what's what's up, buddy? And then... And then I'm like, I didn't get an email. And then we, I called you and then we talked. And so it was about three days. So it was pretty fresh. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I was excited. I was almost more excited with their story than I was with, with you, my own. Yeah. yeah. I, they, these guys planned this out. This was no uh, accident or happenstance or nothing like that. This This was a... You know, my part in this, I played a very small part, but my part, part in this was they just used my story to gauge where they should start their hunt. Right, right. That's really all my only part in this, right? It had nothing to do with me. It's just that they they said, okay, well, this is where he was. I know they're from, they're all three of them or all four of them are from that area, let's say, within 20 miles of that area. Yeah. All of them live. So they're fairly familiar with where it was, and they went up there, and sure enough, you know, it, it happened, but uh, I don't know. He never did say the young guy. I wanted to make this clear to your audience. He never did say where he had heard there was a den of them. Yeah. But I got the I got the distinct impression from these guys that these guys are serious individuals. Right. Like these guys aren't me. It's just a guy with some balls that decides I'm going to go, you know, like I did, I'm going to go hunt a dog, man. These guys are, I got the distinct feeling that the two older ones are ex military survivalists. Maybe. Yeah. Well be that or ex military, maybe ex special forces. I don't know that right. they were, but that's just the feeling that they gave me. They didn't seem to have any fear <clears throat> well, whatsoever they, of these animals. Right. They were tactical on the way, like, cause there was, and I, I remember, I remember this because when you told me, I my, my brain was just blown away. Um, but the one thing that made me think how tactical they were is the kid with the bolt action. His dad, when they were backing out, his dad told him to go up on the opposite ridge in right. case any came out as they were backing out, so he yep. could have a clear shot at them to keep, you know, um, a yeah, line I didn't of sight on them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I didn't put that in this email that I sent you, but that's true. He was left by himself high up on the other hill and he was, he, he, um, he had a scoped 338, which is a fairly, I mean, it's a little more powerful than a 30 odd six. So we're, you know, you're talking about, you hit him in the head with that. It's all over. Yeah. But, he he was up on the side, and then what, what he did was he covered their exit from the Box Canyon. And then when they got to the opening of the Box Canyon, they all spread out and covered him while he came down and ran out. So and then they and then each of them would go fifty yards, and then they would cover each other all their way out. The, you know, the two miles back to the sunken, and then the five miles back, they were completely tactical all the way out because, and rightly so, they they thought there would be a counterattack. That these guys, these and these animals are very tactical. They thought that they would marshal their forces, and there'd be eight or ten of them would be following them, but they never did. <clears throat> right, right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I might be wrong, but I'm trying to remember because we had a conversation. We talked after you told me this, which was about the length of what you just shared. Um, <clears throat> you and I talked for, I don't know, an hour more about certain things. Um, I remember making a statement. What For some reason, I keep thinking like there was no phone. They didn't bring their phones. No, they didn't. That's true. They they didn't bring their. He didn't tell me that in that. But mm. the 
the young guy, not not the leader, but the young guy had said that because I asked at one point. Um, that's another thing. You got a good memory, dude. That's another thing that I forgot to put in the email. That one of uh, I asked it was me asking the question. I said, "Well, how come? How come you guys didn't get pictures?" And the young guy said, "Well, we didn't take our phones." Right. And, and then I thought, hmm, "That's interesting." Yeah, because we were talking about how that the two government agents were that one that walked up on you while you were walking out and the other one that was on the right. back of the truck, how the hell they knew you were there, but they didn't know they were there. And I was like, did you have your phone with you? And you're like, yeah, and I did. I did. So maybe that was, you know, because like you said, you had your phone, you were there, you had, you know, had a, a little skirmish compared to this with it. Um, helicopter flew over and then one of these guys came out at you, uh, to, you know, address the situation or clean up your mess. Um, but yet here, no, there was no kind of repercussion. I, yeah, I asked him, Jeff, I asked him <coughs> at the very end of the conversation and forgive me, I hope your audience will forgive me because I did forget quite a few things. Um, that's why I, I, well, I started writing this a couple of weeks ago, but I, I'd say half of it I did today because I wanted to give it to Jeff. I promised him I'd give it to him. I wanted to keep my word. But he, I had asked him if, they, if he encountered anybody or any like government agency or officer from any you know three-letter agency or anything like that and he goes well why would we and i said well i don't know i'm just asking just out of curiosity and he goes no we didn't have our phones how would anybody know how would have anybody known we were there right so these guys dude i'm telling you these guys were if i was gonna go hunting dog man i they might if i could go with these four guys they might convince me to go out there again with them let's put it that way they they went they, like you said, you felt that there was something different about the two older guys, you know, maybe ex-Special Forces, whatever, ex-Service. But they had one goal in mind, and, and it wasn't getting pictures. It was, let's go hunt these things. And they, and they were not apologetic <clears throat> about it. So there's going to be a small part of your audience and a a large part of some other people who do these sh channels audience who are going to completely ha would hate these guys right because right. they're they're not about peace and oh let's go pray to them and get down and ask their permission to you know these guys are straight up what i would call warriors and just decided you know what and i got the feeling that they were longtime listeners um well they've killed you know like you and i said they've dogmen kill dogmen kill you know like they're opportunists yeah yep. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think you had asked or one of them had said, but didn't get into detail that one of them had seen a dog man at one time years ago or something like that, but he didn't get into detail and it wasn't around that area. Like they just no, used no, your experience because they were close by. Right. That's <clears> true. <throat> one of them had mentioned he was out just hunting. He was it wasn't a tactical uh, engagement. It was just he was out hunting, and he had seen what he believed was a dog man. He didn't get close to it. He was far enough away that it didn't see them. He was looking at it through binoculars, but he was convinced from that day forward that these animals existed. Right. Yeah. You know, I, to me, um, this experience when you when you when you told me about it i was you know blown away because I, i'd never heard anything like it you know um this is why jeff let me just say and i said this on another show one time and i took a lot of shit for it the truth is dude as as evil and wicked as i believe these animals are and again i don't think that every single one of them is always thinking about killing humans whenever they get the chance right I don't believe that, but I do think they're opportunists, and if they're hungry and you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong, wrong time, they have no problem tearing you you know, into shreds, Yeah, none, and will drag you back to the den, and they'll all feast on you. I really believe that about them, right? Yep. But 
I said this on another show one time that when you bring the full power of man to bear, these anim- we shouldn't fear these animals, at least not to the degree that we do. They should fear us. Yeah. Because this, this group proves that if four guys didn't know what they're doing, and they didn't even have – these guys didn't even have grenades or grenade launchers or just, just fully automatic weapons. And look at what they did to them. Imagine if we had 12 um, spec ops guys that had rocket launchers, grenade launchers, fully automatic weapons, hand grenades. I mean, come on. You could, you're talking a squad of special forces could wipe out 100 of these animals. Oh, no yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why I, I don't – I've never had the attitude that some people, not necessarily just on your show but other shows, have had where, oh, my God, we have to be – you know, these animals are, are – we either have to worship them on the one hand or we have to be so afraid of them that we, that we don't you know, do live our lives the way that we should. No, it's not that way. It, we, we are still – and I know I'm going to take shit for saying this, but we are still the, the dominant – the dominant uh, animal, if you will, on this earth. Yeah, yeah. And when we bring our full power to bear, these animals present very little problem. Right, right. Very little. They, like and you I said, they're opportunistic. They are, you know, like me solo hiking, you solo hiking, you know, or random hikers, you know, Joe Blow that's out in Colorado somewhere that doesn't have a firearm with him. And, you know, like you said, wrong, wrong place, wrong time. Bam. Opportunistic. Um, oh, you're, 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 you're in a lot of trouble, dude. <laughs> you're in a lot of trouble. And it's gotten to me. And I, I don't want people to say I don't fear them. I do. This is why I'll never go in the woods again. Right. But when you're talking about guys like this who have the ability to bring these types of weapons to bear, I mean, I, I took it like when those animals were looking, when they were all still huddled in that den, and the one kid got up there and looked into the den from across one hill to the other, and he could see them in there. I got the distinct visual in my mind that they were all cowering in there because they knew that if they came out, that they were going to get literally cut in half. Right. Like almost they and didn't so, know what to do. Right. They were exactly. That's exactly right. Like they didn't know what to do. They were just hoping that these guys wouldn't finish the job. Right. Right. And these guys would have been fully capable of doing that. I mean, honestly, I think even if they would have went up there and and stood right in front of the hole, I think they would have chopped them into bits. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I know that, you know, there's going to be some people that hear this and be like, oh, you know, you're starting, like I heard on the other channel, now it's going to be unsafe for these animals, uh, for us to walk in these areas. It was already unsafe for us to walk in these areas, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. This makes them think, as far as I'm concerned, this makes them think twice about just randomly attacking people because they, you know, they don't know what, what type of person is this. Is this one of these people that has these, these weapons that will just turn us into hamburger? Right. right. And that's exactly what he – those were his words, <clears throat> by the way. He said, we turned him into hamburger. Yeah. It's just – I mean my, my, my view is – you know, these guys went for a mission, they went on a mission and they, I, they wanted to see that if they could do it and they did, you know, um, I, I, I don't suggest that everybody go out and, you know, unless you have, unless you have the, the, uh, know-how of doing what they did, you know, um, being a gunsmith and such, but not, not everybody can, you know, so don't go out with your, AR-15 and four of your friends with just semi-automatic and think that you're going to get out of there. Um, you know, it's just... No. And they, they, these, these, hmm? these guys were serious individuals, Jeff. Yeah. You could tell just by looking at them. They were, they all had that... I don't know if you've ever seen it, but like when you see a special forces guy or an ex-special force, there's like an, there's an error about him. Like he... A confidence. Like there's no situation that he can't handle. All these guys had that, right, right, and and you can just tell these guys they had a, they put a plan together. They they researched what they were going to do. They made their weapons better than what you know you and I have access to, and you know they they drew up a plan and and they went and executed it. Then and that just goes to show, 
if nothing else, if, if you don't agree with anything else I've said tonight, it just goes to show that when three or four guys get together and decide they're going to do something, it doesn't matter, Bigfoot, reptilian, you know, crawler, whatever. If you have four guys that are well-armed, that know what they're doing, understand tactical uh, awareness and all that stuff, they're a formidable um, force no matter what they face. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, like, it's not, it's, I, you, <clears throat> you said it, and, you know, there are people that, there are people that are going to be upset, you know, like, oh my God, why, you know, but that just because someone feels one way doesn't mean they feel the other, you know, like these things are monsters. They are not friendly. They're not like Harry and the fucking Hendersons. You no, know what I mean? These like, are not, these are not furry woodland creatures. That's what I used to say all the time. They're not, they, they, and I'm not suggesting that we need to go exterminate no. every single one of them. However, <clears throat> if it turns out that they are not natural and we're not put here by our God and they're some sort of a hybrid that we created, well, then I have no problem from that for them being wiped out. Right, right. This just shows that they can be. Yeah, that, that's another thing, too, you know. Some of your, I mean, actually, I don't even think it was one of your guests, but some other people have said that, you know, and again, it's possible, you know, that there's some other type of dog man that is some sort of spiritual or, you know, I hate to use that word, but, you know, can, can camouflage itself and bullets don't affect it and all this other crap I've heard. Maybe it's true. I, I don't know. I mean, if you'd have told me that Dogman existed five years ago, I would have laughed in your face and looked at what I've experienced, right? So right. it's possible, but here's what I know. In my experiences, which have been many, and this guy, these guys experience, these animals are completely flesh and bone and can be killed and even massacred. Yeah. That's what I know. Yep. Now, whether or not there's another type out there that exists that that somehow bullets don't work, okay, maybe, but I've never encountered it. Right. That's what I know. Right, right. You know what you know, I, and, you know, I don't know because I never shot at one. I know what I saw. I don't know what the hell it was. It just was really scary. Um, you know, but this the, the, the point of this experience was they can be stopped. And it, and it, and it, they were, um, they can be stopped in a big way, Jeff. That's yeah. what we learned from this experience. <laughs> yeah. And again, I don't want anybody to think you know, this was somehow, you know, I told these guys secretly cause I'm sure I have my haters on your channel and other channels that hate me. And I'm sure they're, Oh, he told these guys to go do this. I had, I, I never saw these guys before. I did not know them. Right. I'd never talked to them before. This, th these are people that just so happened to be listeners to your show. <clears throat> right. And I heard and overheard a conversation. And again, they didn't come to me. I went to them. Yeah. So what what reason would they have to lie about this? Right. You intruded on their 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 dinner right. and their story. You know, they're 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 shooting the shit, having their you know country fried steak and gravy and out comes brady to say hey you know i heard the, uh, and you know so 100 i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure that young guy knew who he i was i don't know it for sure but I, well, i'm pretty sure brady is brad with said. a y <laughs> right that's, that's exactly the best part about it too he's like your name's brady and i said <laughs> yeah and he just kind of smiled at me like oh okay yeah, uh, I gave him. I gave him hints. I, I mentioned that I was a the SoCal surfer. surfer. SoCal. Yeah, 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 you did. So, um, so they if they, they listen to this, they're going to know for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, now I got. I want to kind of switch subjects real quick um, before we end the interview. Um, I was not aware that at one point you had a Bigfoot encounter. I knew of one, but I didn't know of one that was prior to all of your dogmen experience. And um, Brad and I are, he's never going back out in the woods ever again, unless, you know, one thing does occur. But we are gonna have an upload 
in the future, maybe not the near future, but in the future, where Brad shares his Bigfoot experience with us. Um, that I'm going to go ahead and share. I'm going to go ahead and announce because I felt like I cheated your audience because I know you had talked about this last September when I had uh, a Bigfoot encounter in a different place, a separate not up where I go, where I went, where we were just talking about this last encounter that these guys had, but in a different place, uh, more like in central Arizona, I had a Bigfoot encounter and I was going to tell Jeff about it. And I, I did, actually did tell Jeff about it, but then I panicked because they erased. I had a picture, uh, several pictures actually, of very clear footprints that were 17 inches um and i didn't share this with jeff because i panicked when i they erased the pictures and then i actually took my phone to the apple store um to find out if i could retrieve them and they said that those photos they never existed they're not in my memory well there's only one group of people that can see something like that yeah so um i panicked a little bit and i remembered the warnings that i got but that last guy made it clear to me um that nobody believes me anyway. So if what I think what Jeff's planning on doing is having me give both of my, they're not, these are not, um, um, fully engaged. Let's put it that way. Um, encounters with a Bigfoot where like, it's a knockdown drag out, you know, these are just encounters that I had. One was in 2006 or 2007 up at Mount Shasta. I was hiking with a, a somebody that works for me. And then the other one was um, last September. I was walking in a different place, hiking in a different place by myself, uh, and I encountered a Bigfoot. Um, but I'll leave the rest of that for yeah. The next so it's going to be not in the near future, but in the future because I know you've got some stuff coming up, and you know. But it it just I never knew, and I'm not going to mention the the channel or whatever, but. I never knew that you had shared this on another channel and till last night. And I was like, wait, what? And you're like, yeah. yeah. Well, I wasn't in I wasn't interviewed. You were interviewed. He just read, right. He just read the story. Right. That's all. And it's actually a very interesting experience, but we'll save that for a whole different, different day. Um, yep. But yeah, this was, I mean, thank you for, you know, being a man of your word and, you know, like I, I, I did say, cause I had made an announcement. I was like, you know, in a week or whatever, uh, I'm going to have Brad on and, you know, people, I said this, people have things that come up, people have, you know, issues and shit on, un, un, unannounced issues that pop up and he couldn't come on. And, but you did, you finally were able to, and you've always well, been a man of your word. So your audience knows I'm a financial guy and there's a lot of things that happen in the market that I have to pay attention to and that I get involved with. And, um, sometimes uh, it gets consuming because I'm in front of my computer screen a lot, um, right. watching the markets and stuff. I don't want to give away too much of what I do because I don't want anybody showing up at my house, but, um, I just just say I'm a finance guy. And, um, sometimes that means I have to work, um, a lot longer at my computer during the day and sometimes even into night. And sometimes with that, I get busy studying charts and stuff like that. And then I don't, I don't, um, you know, have the time to, to wrap with uh, Jeff about certain things. Not that I don't want to, but you know, we all have life and it yeah. happens, right? So right. no, I just appreciate I it. You, I get you the story. Yeah. And I appreciate it. And you've always, you know, you've never, you never said, you know, you're going to come on and not, um, but except that one time, but there was a val valid reason for it. And, and I completely understood, um, which in the near I, future, I, you guys I, will know about it. So, <laughs> yeah, I panicked. I, I absolutely Who panicked. Wouldn't? Who wouldn't? I, you know, I don't want to ever uh, find myself on a list, although I'm sure I'm already on some list somewhere, but. I, you know, when they erase those photos, I, I kind of panicked as Jeff will tell you, I'm sure he's mentioned it. I, yeah. you know, I panicked a little bit because, 
you know, when that happens and you're like, wait a minute, I took these photos. They, I saw them on my phone and now the Apple people are telling me that these, fo- these photos were not in the memory nowhere. Right. Well, you know, that's a little scary because they should have at least been in my memory. In your cloud, yeah, or somewhere, you know, like, but nope. And I remember that day, like, you were, I've never heard you freaked out and you've, like, we've talked, we've talked for a while, like, me and you have become friends. And, you know, that day, it was a very short conversation, one, because you're just like, you know, I'm like, hey, you still coming on? You're like, I'm not coming on. I'm not even going to talk about it. Don't want to talk about it. Da, 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 done. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> like that's pretty much the conversation. Yeah, and I felt I, I held that I held that feeling for quite a while until uh, um, last month or two months ago now, whenever it was that I had my last encounter where that guy told me that he just looked at me point blank and said, nobody believes you anyway. You can go on. He even mentioned going on your show. So I was like, that was kind of to me like, okay, they, they really don't care anymore. So I'm willing to share. Um, those are the only two other stories that I have. I don't have any reptilian stories. Okay. I don't have any crawler stories. I don't have any other, I don't have any ghost stories uh, or anything. Some of the stuff Jeff's into the paranormal. I don't have any stuff like that. All I have left is a couple of Bigfoot stories and I don't want to build them up because they're nothing like the dogman encounters that I had. These are just this, but these things did happen. Uh, one happened way before I even knew what a dogman was. And the other one happened uh, last September um, in a completely different place. Right. So, um, but I'll be glad to share and we can make a show of it whenever yeah. you decide. If you want to wait a few weeks or. If yeah, you we'll wait a couple of weeks or whatever. Let things, let things uh, settle and see how you feel in a couple of weeks. But um, uh, let's end this interview um obviously don't hang up because i want to talk to you for a little bit let me say let me say goodbye to your audience i want to thank them for want to thank them for tuning in and listening to me i appreciate your audience i read a lot of the comments um and i really appreciate uh the type of people you have for the most part and um until next time uh, take care and peace out all right it was awesome having you on thank you All right, folks, I hope you all enjoyed today's second half as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. After all, it is your support that keeps the channel growing and going and what gives folks like all of us a place and a chance to share our experiences and theories judgment free. Just simply treat it with the respect that we all deserve. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions. Never stop searching for the truth. And God bless.